blessings to you and your family. We bring you greetings from Denise Center Ministries. Enjoy encouraging messages from Providence Denise Center. For Denise's books, products, listening, and viewing schedule, please log on to dcenter.org. That's D as in Denise, center.org. Hi, I'm Denise Center. Welcome to my webcam. I have a great topic for you today. We're going to be discussing the cross, Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because we know on Sunday is Easter, and we're all going to be dressed up in our beautiful clothes celebrating his resurrection. So I want to attempt to teach you about the cross, why Jesus died for us, why we celebrate Easter, and why we're having a big to-do, because it is a big to-do. Did you know Jesus died for your sins. He died so that you might live. Did you know that him dying on that cross, he had you on his mind? Israelites' household, for their children not to be harmed, they had to take the blood of the lamb and take that blood and put it on their doorposts and keep that blood there in order for the angel to pass by. He was thinking about every issue, everything that may have happened to you in order for you to live a free, successful life. So every time you see or witness something that's very harsh or damaging, know this, Jesus paid it all, been there, he knows what it feels like, and he suffered the most hor horrific death anyone can ever suffer so that we can live the most successful life that anyone can ever live. So I want to attempt to show you how to appreciate the cross and how to really better understand why Jesus died for you. First of all, let's talk about the Passover because that's what we're celebrating now. We're in the Passover week and we're celebrating the fact that Jesus is alive. He's not dead. He's alive. If you go to the book of Exodus, you're going to find the Israelites when they were in bondage serving an evil Pharaoh who hated God. And they had to literally do things with no money and just, just in slavery and in bondage. So the Lord raised up a prophet named Moses to go and fight for his people. And they began to, to serve the Lord and reverence the Lord. And through that, there was a series of plagues that happened. And one of the plagues was the death of the firstborn in the Egyptian's household. And in order for... When a death angel looked down and saw the blood, it would pass over that home. And the homes that didn't have the blood, that's where the death occurred. So the Israelites were protected by the blood. We today, too, are protected by the blood. And the reason why we choose unleavened bread or Jews choose unleavened bread around this time is because they didn't have time to put yeast or make their bread rise. So they use unleavened bread and cook their bread that way and took the yeast out so that the meal would cook faster so that they could have time enough to escape. So Jews practice that today to eat unleavened bread around that time. And did you know special prayers go up around this time as well? And Jesus answers those special prayers. So it's very important to know why we do certain things and why they did certain things because it can actually benefit us today. And as we celebrate the Passover, as we are reminded that when we take the wine and the bread represents his blood and his body, that Jesus literally said, take this wine as my blood. Take this bread, he broke it and said, as my body, and eat it and know that this is my blood, this is my body. Remember my broken body, remember my blood shed so that you might live. And we're going to do that even on Easter on Sunday, we're going to participate. And even do, throughout the year, we often do the communion to be reminded of Jesus' death and his blood. So I want you to always know that the cross is very important and very significant in our lives. If the cross wasn't so, we wouldn't be here today. No, you would not be here. You would not be able to say you are saved, sanctified, and filled with the blood of Jesus Christ. There would be no redemption. Once you're dead, you're gone. That's it. Life is over for you. But because Jesus died for you, you are alive forever. Did you know your spirit lives forever beyond this place? So don't get earth as a paradise. No, heaven is your paradise. Don't look at earth as your eternal resting place. No, 
earth is. You have a mansion that Jesus is preparing for you. He said, when I go, I am going to be in heaven with my father, preparing a place just for you. And Jesus knows your likes. He knows exactly what you like and he knows your dislikes. He knows if you're traditional. He knows if you're modern. So your mansion is going to look like the desires of your heart. Isn't it awesome how Jesus takes the desires of your heart and makes a place for you? It's so much better than here. Everything on earth is fallen. This is under sin. So when you go to heaven, the wood you see here isn't going to be the wood you see there. The flowers you see here isn't going to be anything like the flowers you're going to see in heaven. The gold you see here don't look anything like the gold you see in heaven because we are walking on things that were after sin, but in heaven, there is no sin. So you're going to see a glorified place filled with magnificent things. And when you receive that crown of glory and God tells you that the work you've done on earth was finished so that you could live an eternal life, isn't that something how God rewards you too? We too get rewarded and get a crown. I want to now talk about the seven last words of Jesus while he was on that cross. How every breath was excruciating and very painful for him. It took three long hours just for him to say seven sentences. Isn't it something? How much suffering must he have been going through for it to take that long just to say seven sentences? Wow, Lord, I just want to stop right now and say thank you. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for getting on that cross and being nailed, your hands and your feet and blood rushing out of your body, the lashes that you took, all of the scars that were on your face, your flesh as it was torn to pieces and to shreds. Your face was unrecognizable. I want to stop and say thank you. You didn't have to do that, but you did. Thank you for choosing me, for dying for me. The best I could do is serve you and appreciate your work and your ministry. Because if it not, had not been for you, I wouldn't be able to do what I do today. So thank you. Thank you for saving not only me, but saving the world. Yes, thank you, Lord. As you begin to really appreciate God more, the more of him comes inside of you and the more sensitive you become to the cross because you know it should have been you up there. Jesus died for a thief. He died for a sinner. He died for a liar. He died for a fornicator. He died for a murderer. There is no greater sin and there's no little sin. Sin is sin. So just because a person doesn't have that same sin you have doesn't mean they're more of a horrible person than you. No, God looks at sin as all sin it falls short of the glory of God and he hates it and in order for him to show us how horrible sin was to him and how it separates us from him he had to choose his best and and slay it and use it as a sacrifice and show us that through his death we live because sin causes death and Jesus died for us and showed on that cross his love what does the cross represent? It represents the greatest love that could ever be expressed or could ever be shown to humankind. It shows a love that no one can ever duplicate again because God was well pleased with his son. The seven last words, his first words were, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. This man was saying, Lord, forgive the persons who put me on this cross. He was offering forgiveness at those final hours. Isn't that something, how forgiveness was on his mind? He didn't have wrath and hate and envy and, and murder on his mind. He had forgiveness on his mind. His second last words were, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. He took the time to save one of the men on the side of him. He took the the time to let them know you're going to be in paradise. Do you know why Jesus did that? To let us know that we will be in paradise to see him. We're going to see exactly who he is. And I can't, I don't know about you. I can't wait to see Jesus. The first person when I get to heaven, 
I wanted to be Jesus. I want to see him face to face. I want to see the man who died for me. And when I see the nails in his hands and his feet, and when I bow down to him, Lord Jesus, that's going to be the most, the most, the best day of my entire life. Nothing can ever match that. And I can't wait. Amen. And I know you can't either. So by him letting that man know that he was going to be in paradise was a way that Jesus was letting us know that while he was on that Christ, he had paradise in mind. His third words were, he said to the woman, this is your son. Then he said to his disciple, this is your mother. He was letting them know, love each other, take care of the generation. He was speaking to generations right then and there to let them know what I taught you. I want you to embrace each other and put that word into your generation. Mother, speak to your son. Son, take care of your mother. Mother, remember the love I gave you. Remember the love I shown you. Remember how I taught you. Teach him what I taught you. Son, always take care and respect your leadership. Always. So he was showing a sign of leadership and a sign of love because the greatest commandment was love. And why did he choose a mother and a son? Wow. We need men in the earth. We need fathers in this earth right now. He was speaking to the man, take care of the woman. Then he was speaking to the woman, nurture the son, because we need the mothers to birth and we need the fathers to do the caring and to cultivate and to do their job. If the fathers would raise up, my Lord, if the fathers would stand, we would have a stronger nation. Jesus had everything on his mind. Can you see how important the cross is now? Is it becoming more clear to you? Is it becoming more special? I sure hope it is. That fourth word was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At this split second, God turned his face away from Jesus and the whole world became black and dark. For that split second, Jesus felt totally alone and isolated so that we today will never feel that feeling again. You can never feel the loneliness Jesus felt on that cross because he took our place right then and there. I know we have some lonely times in our life, but nothing can compare to the lonely time Jesus was on that cross when his father turned from him and forsook him so that we can always have an eternal light in us that we will never be in the dark again. Jesus says today and he promised us i will never leave or forsaken you so you have the promise of the lord to know that jesus is always in you he's right there when you feel alone just call him up and watch what happens that fifth word was i thirst how could the man who was the living water be thirsty how could the man who said i'm the water i'm life become thirsty that's because he gave us every ounce of him. He didn't hold back anything. As the blood and water rushed out of his spirit, out of his body, it became ours. What is that living water today? It is the word of Jesus. It is this Bible right here because Jesus is the word. When you're feeling thirsty and when you're in a dry place, begin to read the word of God. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead you in scripture and it will tell you and show you exactly what you need right then and there to feel that thirst, to, to make sure that those dry places aren't desolate, to make sure that you are covered in every area. The word has everything we need from measurements to how to build, to how to take care of, to cultivate, to how to nurture, everything we need, even to build the foundations of this whole world is in this word of God. If you practice it, I guarantee you when you're thirsty, it will quench your thirst. The best thing we have on earth that quenches our thirst is water. Pop can't do it, juice can't do it, but it's something about that clear liquid, that water. And the water that Jesus left us today was his word. I guarantee you in a dry place, when you begin to read his word and you can say, by his stripes, I am healed. It's gonna fill that void right inside of you, right then and there. When you're feeling dry and you're able to open up that word and say, though they slay me, yet will I trust in the Lord. 
it will fill a dry place. When you can read the word and say, no weapon formed against me shall prosper, that fills a void and that fills that quench and that thirst. Use the living word for your thirst. It works every single time. That sixth word, my Lord, was when, was when Jesus received the wine. He said, it is finished. He said, it is finished, not he is finished. That meant that his work was done. It was complete. He done what he was sent on earth to do. So if another apostle rise up or prophet or whoever they call themselves to be, say that they are the savior and they're going to die for your sins, you better run and run fast because the Lord is well pleased with what Jesus has done. He's well pleased with his work to the place that today every knee bows at his name. Every person confesses at his name. Isn't that something how at the name of Jesus that we all bow? Even Satan has to bow. Even demonic hosts has to bow at the name of Jesus. So when you're in trouble, call on Jesus. When you're in need, call on his name. There is nothing more powerful than the name of Jesus. It was finished. His work was done. But he is still alive and he's still in you. How do you know Jesus is alive? Because he gives us those small moments where we know that Jesus is here. He gives us miracles, signs and wonders. The Bible says so. Signs and wonders follow those who believe. So if you slow down through your busy day and pay attention to those small signs and wonders, you're going to see how Jesus follows you throughout your work and throughout your day. Isn't it awesome? He's always there. Even in your struggles, he's there. Wow, awesome stuff. The seven words were, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. The nails didn't actually kill him. Mm -mm. Guess what killed him? It was him giving up his spirit because Jesus was God. He had to give his spirit up in order to die. If he did not say those words and give up or command his spirit to give up the ghost, he would not have died. So he had to command his spirit to die. That's just how powerful he was. Nobody on this earth has that power to command their spirit to die. Nobody on that earth has that power. Jesus had that power and he had the power to get back up again. And he showed himself to the disciples on the third day that he is risen off of that cross. And do you know what that did? That sparked a joy inside of them that made them run and spread the gospel of Jesus. And when they saw that he had risen and he was alive, that was enough for them to even risk their own life. Many of the disciples were in prison talking about Jesus. They were were abused and battered and beaten and, and a lot of bad things happened to them. But because they saw that this man was alive, was enough to believe in his ministry and to know he was exactly who he said he was. And out of their faith and belief for what they saw with their own eyes, we get to believe today. And you know why we do what we do? Do you know why I serve the Lord the way I do? It is because God has shown me he's alive. It's not just because of what a person said. It's out of the faith that I believe, out of the grace that I'm saved, and out of the miracles that he has personally shown me. I know Jesus lives. I know he's here on this earth. I know he's right here. I know he's in heaven. He's everywhere. His spirit lives and reigns because he shows me those moments. And if you look in your day, if you look in your spirit, you will say the same. Jesus lives. He lives us in us all. If you have breath in your body, you still have a chance to get it right. Did you know because of your salvation, you can't lose your salvation? Once you become saved, you're always saved. So that means no man can unsave you and no man can put you in hell. The best thing he can try to do is make you feel like there's hell on earth. The best the enemy can do is torture your soul or your spirit. He wants to torture you as much as he can. 
But when you recognize that it is the enemy, you rebuke that spirit and you begin to call on the love of Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I need you to rise up in me right now. Take complete control and take care of the situation and rebuke that enemy and watch what happens. Perhaps you're listening to this program and you don't understand a lot of what I've shared. You may not have even known the story of Jesus or why he got on the cross. And I hope this has sparked some interest in you. So if you are one who is looking at this program right now and you're saying, hmm, perhaps I want to be saved. I want you to do just that. All you have to do is believe in your heart, confess in your, with your mouth that he is Lord and you are saved. Want to do it? Let's do it. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Say, I believe you died for me and rose again. From this day forward, take my life, take control and lead and guide me. Forgive me of my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. If you just confess with your mouth that prayer and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you're saved. Welcome to the kingdom. You're my brother or sister in the gospel of Jesus. I love you, but Jesus loves you more. Thank you for listening. I sure hope this program has blessed you. Don't forget, follow me on Facebook and Twitter. And remember, Jesus is Lord. God bless you. Thank you for listening to Denise Center Ministries. We pray that this message helped you with your special needs. To order our products, log on to www.dcenter.org. Until next time, may the Lord richly bless your endeavors serving the kingdom. Thank you.